So I bring you greetings from the United States. Um, I know you in the UK are facing tremendous challenges, but at least you don't have to put up with the mad tweeter every morning, <laughs> otherwise known as our president. Um, and, and by the way, thank you so much for not having bugged our president, as it appears. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but to be honest, the trends in the United States have been bad for a long time, far longer than the rise of Donald Trump. You know, we have the largest economy in the history of the world, and in many regards, the most successful, not for tens of millions of Americans, but in general. And yet, compared to 21 OECD countries, the United States ranks last in virtually every ranking category. We are 21 out of 21 in life expectancy, infant mortality, income inequality, poverty, the homicide rate. We are 20th out of 21 in terms of student math scores and mental health care. We rank number one in only one category, military spending. <laughs> and President Trump's new budget calls for expanding that by an additional $57 billion, every penny of which in his new budget is taken out of social services to give to the military for programs such as one called Meals on Wheels, which provides foods for poor senior citizens. But let me say that even at this challenging and in many ways dark times in my country, I am filled with hope. And I am present to the opportunities for transformative change of our United States political economy, just as you were talking about the opportunity for change in yours. Consistent with the vision that has been so ably articulated by our speakers in this morning's opening plenary and in all the discussions I've heard. So this is a humbling experience for me because I come here, uh, frankly, I wish there were meetings in the United States that would duplicate what you all are doing in this room today. And I know you've done it in many, many other settings across the country. So let me say just a few words about our organization to give you a little more background. And then I really want to focus on what John uh, described in, in what we're doing in Cleveland. So we are a US-based think tank. Uh, really focused on trying to bring forth in the United States the next economic paradigm. Working not only on the ideas and vision of a new economy and new economics, but also on the application on the ground of those ideas and the policies and building the politics to support those ideas. Our audacious goal, now I have to acknowledge at my age, I may not see this uh, goal, but we hire lots of millennials who hopefully will see this. Our audacious goal is that our work in partnership, of course, with many others, will form the basis for the new politics in America and the transformation of our corporate capitalist political economy toward a next system rooted in the values and principles of equity, inclusion, community, shared ownership, and environmental sanity. We Wouldn't you love to live in a system like that and wake up every day knowing that it's a great day because the system you live in has produced in the last 24 hours more equality, better economic and environmental outcomes than the day before? Because the system we live in now in Cleveland, Ohio, where I live, literally I wake up on a Friday morning and I know there will be more wealth and income inequality on that Friday than there was on Thursday. That we live in systems and they produce certain logical outcomes consistent with the design of the system. So if we want new outcomes, we have got to get serious and redesign the systems in which we live. We carry out our work on many fronts. Let me just give you a few examples. We build models of broad-based community ownership in cities around the country. I'm going to share with you about Cleveland, Ohio. We are actively organizing institutions of higher education and health systems all over the United States. They represent in the aggregate a one trillion, with a T, a one trillion dollar industry in the United States. 
We are working with them to focus their activity on local social procurement, local hiring of, of uh, marginalized peoples, local investment to rebuild the economies of communities that have been left behind and cities that have been thrown away. We're involved in a national movement to establish public and city banks across the country to move beyond the current financial system that is ill-serving our people. We're issuing this year a book on public enterprise in the United States to try to break the myth that privatization is the only way to run uh, elements of the economy. We're promoting mass transit strategies linked to broad-based worker and community ownership companies. We have initiatives to further what we call energy democracy, local ownership and control of green energy production and its dissemination. And we've launched an initiative that we call 50 by 50, designed to expand worker ownership in the United States to 50 million Americans by the year 2050, a five-fold increase from where it is now. As the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer said this morning and has said in the past, democracy and decentralization are the watchwords of our program. These are our values as well. Now I want to talk to each of you, that was a little advertisement about the collaborative and gives you some background. I really want to talk to each of you now very personally. And I mean that the person sitting in your seat, not the aggregate of the couple hundred people here, but each of you in your seat. Because you are, each of you and each of us, an essential actor in shaping the arc of history and bending it towards social justice and economic democracy. With you, all things are possible, and without you, we cannot move forward. So you are the key to shaping the new reality that we intend to bring forth in your country and in the United States. The other morning, I was listening to a radio program on National Public Radio, our public broadcasting system, and it was about the many global threats that our planet faces. And it was really wide ranging, climate change, destruction of species, nuclear weapons, even some information about a potential asteroid hitting the United States, or hitting the world and destroying it. And I thought to myself, we can more easily imagine the end of life on this planet than we can imagine that capitalism as we know it can fundamentally change. That's extraordinary. We can imagine the whole planet gone, but not the transformation of capitalism as an economic system, which, by the way, did not descend from God. It was created by people like us over time. So it's a real failure of imagination. A few years ago in the United States, there was a best-selling book by an academic named Francis Fukuyama called The End of History. His primary thesis was that capitalism had triumphed over state socialism with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and so forth, the breakup of the Soviet Union, and would be forever enshrined as the global economic system and order. End of story. No more historical evolution. It was the end of history. Now, when you live inside a system, and we all do, it is often very difficult to imagine an alternative. Imagine we lived in Pharaoh's Egypt. That system lasted 3,000 years. If you're about 1,500 years into it, you would probably conclude it is never going to change. We will always have pharaohs. We will always have slaves. We will always have pyramids being built. Now, now we go to the British Museum and we look at it. It's done. So the reality is systems come and go. If you look at the sweep of history, it's, it's as common as grass. They just come and go. And I believe now in the UK and in America and around the world, we are facing the next great leap toward a new system in countries all over the world and indeed in the design of the global system. This great turning will be built in large measure by the work and commitment and passion of individuals like yourselves working in your communities from the ground up. In the United States, I believe we're in a period that one might call the prehistory of the next system. We're now in the stages of legitimizing the idea that there can be a next system, that there's something beyond what we have. In many ways, I think the period for us 
you would have to say for yourselves, but for us in the United States, is analogous to a period in our country in the late 1920s and early 1930s. As the Great Depression began to take hold, the ideology of the then government, the Republican government of Coolidge and Hoover, they were the two presidents at this time, their ideology was that there must be no government interference in the market. Things would work themselves out through the miracle of the invisible hand. So Washington, D.C. did nothing. The federal government did nothing as the Great Depression began to gear up. And so the level of pain in our communities and our cities began to grow around the country as things got worse, as unemployment hit 25% and even increased beyond that. People realized that no one was coming to help them from the federal government. And so they took their lives and the lives of their communities into their own hands. They began to invent. They began to create. They created new models. They innovated to solve their local problems. By way of example, in the state of California, and at that time in a province of Alaska before it was a state, people saw that many senior citizens had no families to support them as they aged. So people began to create local funds. They would contribute voluntarily set aside some money from the city government to help people in their old age. In 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt came in, the new Democratic administration, and became president, there was a new political opening. And that small experiment in Alaska and in California, as people just tried to do something that made sense in their community, Roosevelt and his administration lifted that up nationally and it became the basis for the United States social security system. One of the greatest social safety nets that we have in our country, and of course we have nothing compared to what you have. There are other examples of the same phenomenon, where big ideas moved nationally with huge impact once the politics changed and there was an opening. Historians in the United States call this period, this sort of 10-year window, they call it the laboratories of democracy. There's a large literature about it. And I believe we are now forging our own 21st century laboratories of democracy in communities across the United States. I see it all over the country. I, I travel, I see extraordinary things being done. These experiments are laying the foundation for a new politics. They are, in effect, non-reformist reforms. They don't merely tinker with problems at the margins, they seek to address the problems at their systemic origins. So how does a gradual on the ground change of this kind in a community like Cleveland, how can it lead to a larger order transformative possibility? And now I go to the PowerPoint. <laughs> so let me share an example of where I live. I live in Cleveland, Ohio. I moved there to do work, never, my wife is Canadian, as she says to me, of, if I were to make a list of the top 100 cities in the world I would want to live in, Cleveland does not make the list. But she's a real trooper and she has come to Cleveland. So, Cle <laughs> so Cle I've come to love the city, but it's, uh, it's not California, if you know what I mean. Um, so Cleveland is an older industrial city. It's reminiscent of many uh, cities in your country, uh, including Newcastle. In the 1950s, Cleveland was an industrial manufacturing powerhouse. It was always ranked in the five wealthiest cities in America. Today, after decades of deindustrialization, Cleveland is in the top five poorest cities in our country. Roughly 40% of the residents of Cleveland, which are about 380,000 people total, 40% live below the federal poverty line. And we, we uh, uh, determine poverty in America in a very different way than other OECD countries do. If we took the measure that most countries do that have advanced economies of our type, uh, Cleveland would probably have something like 60% of its population living below the poverty line. And so I moved there to do the following to work on what's called a community wealth building strategy. And this will be the final part of my remarks. Um, and we think of this as how do you design a new economy from the ground up? So community wealth building, and John referred to this idea, we think of it as a systems approach to economic development. It's not about a bunch of little projects. It's looking at the whole system of a community and how do you start to alter 
the institutional relationships and structures and policies such that they produce different kinds of outcomes. They produce more wealth and income equality rather than less, by way of example. And there are, it's really an asset ownership sort of strategy because what really matters, America has a very bad income inequality uh, picture, but the wealth inequality is off the charts. It makes the income inequality look good. 400 people in the United States of America, literally 400 individuals, own as much wealth as the bottom 185 million Americans, over half the population. So we've got to get assets and wealth in the hands of people who have been left out of the system. And there are certain drivers of community wealth building. It emphasizes place. It emphasizes ownership. There's a very good uh, session right before this, for those of you who weren't in the room, about uh, public and cooperative ownership. It says it makes sense to give people a stake in the place in which they work. It emphasizes multipliers. Stop the leakage of money out of our community. That's been one of the key strategies for Matthew Brown and Preston. Keep the money going around, floating around in our communities. So we began the Evergreen Cooperatives. Those are some of the people working in them. Very quickly, I'll show you. Uh, I live in a neighborhood called Glenville. It's a 98.5% African-American neighborhood. There are about 20,000 folks in that neighborhood, so I'm clearly an anomaly. Uh, this is about three blocks from my home. This is what it looks like in a lot of Glenville as jobs have fled and uh, uh, economic activity has diminished. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of houses that have been abandoned and boarded up. It's a very difficult situation. And one of the implications of this, and you'll know this, I'm sure you've seen this data from your own country, that 64 is the number, is the uh, life expectancy of a man in the neighborhood next to mine. So my neighborhood, Glenville, this is how it has the same. 64 years old, read African American male. Eight miles due east in a white suburb, overwhelmingly white, the average life expectancy of a male is 88 years. In eight miles, 24 years of life expectancy difference correlated almost precisely to the income and wealth situation <laughs> of the households. So we looked at what were we going to do because as I said, Cleveland's one of the five poorest communities in America. In, in America. So if you're so poor, how can you do anything? What well, we realized right in our community were billions of dollars of assets that were untapped. These are large institutions, hospitals, museums, um, universities. Together, they spend $3 billion a year in goods and services. And yet, virtually all of it left the area, it was not supporting anyone. It was going to Chicago, it was going to Mexico, it was going to China. This is a look at the target area. In the red circle are where all the anchor institutions, the multi-billion dollar institutions are located. All around it, in that footprint there of all the red dots and yellow dots and so forth, those are, that's the neighborhood, that's where I live. Every little dot you see is a sign of disinvestment. Foreclosed housing, people's water or electricity shut off because they can't pay bills, abandoned houses, abandoned property surrounding $3 billion right in the heart of it. The median household income for a family of four in these neighborhoods is below $18,500 US. The US federal poverty line is 22,500. So we mobilized a lot of, again, as Matthew has been doing, we mobilized lots of people representing anchor institutions, the city government, the public sector, the nonprofit sector, and together we started an initiative. Today we have three for-profit businesses that are cooperatives and there are more in the pipeline. The goal, we have 150, 140 employees now. About half of them are now owners of their companies. Um, the people we've hired were largely unemployed. Many of them have what are called euphemistically in the United States barriers to employment, which means, for instance, they used to be incarcerated in federal penitentiary and it's very difficult to get a job. Um, here are the companies. Evergreen Energy Solutions provides green energy to hospitals and universities and other anchors owned by the employees. 
Uh, that's a one megawatt solar field, the largest urban solar field in a low-income neighborhood in all of the United States. It's doing LED lighting and retrofitting and so forth. This is the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. Uh, it does eight to 10 million pounds of healthcare bed linen on an annual basis for the hospitals and so forth. By the way, this company has become phenomenally successful in terms of its profits. And two weeks ago, we had an event where we brought all the worker owners together and distributed the profits from the previous year. Um, and every person got an allocation in their capital account in the company that they own of $3,000 each and $1,200 in your pocket. You can imagine if you came from one of these neighborhoods, that's a life-changing amount of money. And by the way, this is not just about worker ownership. It's about community transformation. So the workers in the company who own it voluntarily contributed 20% of their profits to a nonprofit holding company to build new businesses so other people in the community could have this opportunity as well. The company's not just about the workers, it's about the communities in which the workers live. And finally, we have a project called Green City Growers. If you are eating lettuce or a salad in Northeast Ohio, where Cleveland is, and it's not August, given the growing season, that lettuce is coming from Mexico or California or Arizona, 1,500 miles of carbon-based transportation to get it there. We said, this is insane. Tens of millions of dollars are leaving our community. So we built a four-acre hydroponic year-round greenhouse right in the heart of Cleveland producing 3 million heads of lettuce a year and 300,000 pounds of basil owned by the workers who live in it, who work in it rather. Uh, they now call themselves farmers. Said so never thought I'd be a farmer living in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> so this, I've got two more slides. This is sort of the design of Evergreen. So remember I said we don't, we've got to get beyond projects. We need to get to systemic new alterations. This is part of the Evergreen system. And what it's, what it, if you, it's a little hard for you to follow perhaps, but we leverage the buying power of the major anchor institutions and drive it locally for community benefit. We build up a new regime of for-profit, worker-owned cooperative businesses to supply goods and services with those institutions. The city government, the municipal authority, has given us long-term low-interest loans. They are paid back. Every time I see the mayor, Mayor Jackson, he says, am I getting my money back? <laughs> I assure him he is. But the city authority has invested in this. Philanthropy has invested in it. We've created a technical assistance company to help the other companies to thrive. And the goal is to get well beyond 1,000 jobs through this and impact with three people in each family, perhaps uh, 4,000, 5,000 people. So, in conclusion, the traditional myth of the economy, at least in the United States, is the myth, it's the kind of Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged myth, right? It's about the heroic lone entrepreneur succeeding against all kinds of barriers and challenges and maxing out their credit card to start their company and getting it successful and then flipping it and becoming a multimillionaire. That's the American dream of business. We say community wealth building is a better approach, it's a more collective approach, it's about building community, and it's about building collaboration. And so finally, you've all heard this quote, there's Dr. Einstein, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We have got to get beyond the box that created the problems and stop tinkering around the edges and get to the heart of the matter. So um, thank you very much. If you'd like any more information, you could get it there. It's been a real pleasure. And now you're going to hear the really great speaker, Rebecca.